as he saith unto also in O.C., I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Romans 9 and 25. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of, of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. As a young man married a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. If you love him, be his sheep. If you love him, be his sheep. Well, we're going to start do a little bit of repetition because as God has it, things fit together in his will. So God's good, right? All the time, right? Yes. But is God good to all people or does God just focus the goodness of good people? All people. For Jesus' own words can help us here because how easy is it to love our friends? How natural. But if we want to do something that's hard, we have to love an enemy. But why? Because God's love is not for some, but for all. God's love, he, God loves most those we have trouble loving. And each of us is this coping mechanism that's set to do the easy things in life. We're all programmed to love our friends and hate our enemies. But if you want to have church and to be satisfied and to function in God's perfect will, we have to love all, particularly those who are least likely and least able to return that love. We have a wonderful church here. And we have a lot of love here. But the coping mechanism, I will call those people, still exists. Okay? Because our church is made up of human beings. It's just a human nature thing. But God's called us to be supernatural. To do the hard thing. To love those people. God loves most those who we have trouble loving. So I'm going to repeat some things. And I want you to do the repetition that if you love him, feed his sheep. After I say something. Now, these are things that have been said in my office and around the hallway all around me, okay? So if you hear something you've said, laugh about it because we're just laughing and looking at ways that we can shift and see that those people attitude that we all have as human beings. Those kids need more to do at this church. If you love him, feed his sheep. If those people would just pick up a Bible once in a while, they would understand what we're talking about. If you love him, feed his sheep. If you really wanted help, if they really wanted some help, they'd show up on Sundays. If you love him, feed his sheep. Who hired her anyway? If you love him, feed his sheep. Those people who chose that machine, they were just ignorant. If you love him, feed his sheep. Did those deacons mess that sign up again? Those people think they know it all. Just look at how they dress. Now, I don't want to forgive them. I don't see why it hurts if I'm just nice to them. Those gang members in this neighborhood scare me. Those people get in the way at events. Why should I include them? If you love him, feed his sheep. Everyone is a child of God. If you love him, feed his sheep. And all people make up God's body. If you love him, feed his sheep. Looks like we have had another shooting this week in this neighborhood. I saw somebody with the crime scene tape. If you love him, feed his sheep. That was last Thursday. If you love him, he is from a little higher class than I am. If you love him, well, no, we're, 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 we're. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me, I, uh, I, did 
did you see anything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, those of you who come from the neighborhoods I come from, you don't see anything. That's why I said, if my eye offends me, I can pluck it out, Pastor. <laughs> That's right. But those are our brothers and sisters. There is nothing new in that feeling of us not wanting to be involved. Nothing new. We have those we don't want to think about feeding, those we don't want to bother with, people who get under our skin, whose lifestyles frighten us, who make us mad or have made bad choices in their lives and embarrass us, who hold up our ministries when they get involved. Or we won't, they don't go to church. It's nothing new. God calls us to love all people because God loves most those we have trouble loving. Imagine if you were in a field many, many centuries ago and a large stone stands in the way of the opening of a well. And sheep herders, including a shepherdess named Rachel, want that rock moved back. Well, there happens to be this young man who has come to this area, it's called Aramea, to find a wife. And his name is Jacob. And he's going to show off for this woman. He's going to roll that stone away. And what does she say? Hmm, that's a nice man, right? So she sees Jacob, and he catches her eye, and she catches his. And now notice she's a shepherdess, because we're going to be talking about sheep. That verse that we talked about that, that, that Deacon Scott read to begin with that came from Hosea, its original context was, when he marries this woman, this beloved who was not loved, she will be endowed. And when a woman was endowed back then, they were given a well and pasture land. Okay? So here's Jacob around this well, and he rolls back this stone. And he gets this woman's attention, and he goes to her her father, and her father's name is Laban. We know the story. And, and uh, says, okay, I'd like to marry her. And he says, fine, that's good. Work seven years, you can have her. And then what happens? He gets Leah. Yeah, the blue-eyed one. What if her parents came up with that name? But God loves Leah. Because God loves the ones that we don't open our hearts to. Because God can. And he blesses her with 11 children. Now that is how Abraham's seed was blessed. Had it not been for her, we wouldn't have Judah, therefore Judea. We would not have the Son of God come to us through that lineage. So we have to look at what happens. Was we, we had Joseph, yes, he was a fabulous person who went and he was, you know, worked with Pharaoh and was in Egypt and helped all, of, we know all the stories of Joseph. But look at the 11 that came from Leah. Fast forward four centuries. There's somebody else looking for a wife. Comes to the same well and sits on it. But now the area is no longer called Aramea. It's called Samaria. And he's looking for a wife. Not named Rachel, named Church. He's looking for a wife named Church. And this Samaritan woman is sitting there, and she has made money bilking men out of dowries. Okay, let's get real about what happened with her. She'd marry them, milk them out of whatever they had, go to the next one, go to the next one. Totally unsatisfied, right? But he tells her about the living water. He tells her, there is somebody that can satisfy you more than money and prestige and all. And Samaria is a mixed up place at that time. It's mixed race, mixed religion. They really don't know who they are or what they're about. They're confused. But when she leaves there, she knows one thing. She's loved. She has left that well loved and she spread that news to all the people around and they were saved. They came to know Christ through her. They came to know the great shepherd through what she had to tell them. So here were these two people at the same well. 
There's another stone to be rolled away. There's one over our hearts. With it being Easter time, our heart can be like a tomb. We can roll it back. So that we can spread that same kind of love. We have these two places in the Great Commission as well. Have you looked at the fact that he says in the Great Commission when Jesus says, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel into Samaria and to Judea? If we didn't have these kind of experiences that happened around that well, we wouldn't have Samaria and Judea on that list in the Great Commission. When we don't love the people who are low lives or who have, we have trouble loving, those who have come to us with some sort of difference that stands out. Maybe, you know, in Laban's idea, that his, his daughter was too old or she had weak eyes or whatever, you know, the problem is God doesn't see that. God sees who we are and that we need him. Those of you who teach children know that the neediest children can be the ones that can either, one, get on your nerves, <laughs> Or they can be the ones that when you see them make progress, it means the most to you. There are Leahs everywhere. They probably won't be written about in history or honored with speech, a specialness in any way, but they are God's people. They may not hold positions of wealth, education, or any kind of specialness that we're seeking out, but we are called to feed all his sheep. He, how does God show his, he loves most those we have trouble loving? His mercy is greater. If you read back through the beginning part of Romans 9 that leads up to the verse that we read that came out of Hosea, it talks about how his mercy is abundant. For those who lack abundance, he buys us out of slavery. The higher our price, the greater his compassion for our souls. That too comes out of Romans 9. If our price is higher, his mercy is greater. We are not all the chosen people who act right, do right, smell right, walk right, drink the right things, do the right things, hang with the right crowds, use the right language, have the right degrees, and the list goes on and on. We are all, regardless of our abilities, or our past, or our presence, or the body, we are all the body of Christ that was broken for us. Even those who have wandered off, who have been born maybe as a wild sheep, are all part of his flock. The minute we don't love all those around us, we start missing what it means to be the flock of God. And we begin to act up and be miserable with each other. Let's be honest. When we get picky about who can be in the flock, it starts showing in our attitudes. We are called into God's will and frustration if we aren't functioning in that will. So if God loves most those we have trouble loving, we have to stretch and love others that are hard to love. We have to feed all of his sheep. It's not God's will for us to pick and choose which, feed, which sheep to feed. Which ones are called to be fed? Well, look around you. Where are our grazing grounds? Are we not on the corner of Edgemont and Court? Do we not reside at the corner of where Ridgecrest meets Bellingrath? Is Cloverdale not our backyard? Are we not at the intersection of the old wealthy and those who are the least likely to get off the welfare rolls in Montgomery? How wonderful to have this grazing ground. The harvest where we are grazing is plentiful. The laborers, are they few? No. We got wonderful laborers in this church. We are blessed. We are providing restorative waters of God's love in the valley where the great shepherd has led us. And we're sharing this water the best way, and it helps us to feel satisfied when we do that. We are to give out the water without choosing the people to give it to, 
And it's our role to be at the well serving this living water and to be serving well and witnessing and preparing all to know how truly loved they are.